Welcome everybody back to Veil of Sound. I have the privilege and pleasure and honor to talk to somebody who's probably too humble to admit that he is a living legend. Mike Watt. Uh, Mike, first of all, thanks for joining the show. Ah, oh, thank you so much for having me aboard, truly. Mike, where are we catching you right now? Pedro, where I live. It's the harbor of Los Angeles, Dorsey. Ah, so what is the weather like? Because over here it's ugly cold. Well, you know how the typical weather is here, right? It, yeah. um, it's usually our rain month, but even then it's only a few days. But we're in a weird thing. We had blizzard alert last couple of days, not here in the harbor so much, but just outside of Los Angeles. So freaky weather here. So did you see snow for once in 30 years? Uh, it wasn't here in Pedro, but uh, it's close. There okay. was some hail. There was some hail. One time okay. I seen snow in Pedro, it was around in the 90s, and it only was, uh, it was around New Year's, and it was only for like, Five minutes, it melted right away. It was tiny. Yeah, I remember living in Atlanta in the 90s for, for a year. And, um, well, whatever they call winter wasn't anything close to what I remember from German winter. Mike, we want to talk about the new record that you have out. And, I mean, like being an English teacher, I have to ask the following. To be or not to be? Which do you prefer? What's his name? Edward de Vere, right? 16th Earl of Oxford. Yeah, uh, it's always a question if it's de Vere or if it's somebody else. But you know why I'm asking that question, the right? Recent, he's the most recent. Yeah. Uh, right, right. So, uh, or Hamlet, right? Yeah, Actually, of course. Danish. Of course. And Danish, Danish. God, England is such a mix of different peoples. Well, we're all f full of different peoples. And I think life, you're asking me that kind of question. I think what life has taught me, it's another thing he said, the world's a stage, or whoever wrote that shit. It is Shakespeare. So I think, all I think, the world's a stage, and we are merely players. Yeah, but I don't know if that guy wrote it. The yeah. guy in Stratford. I, somebody using the name, the one with the hyphen. Because <laughs> the guy in Stratford actually put, spelled his name without the E. That's when he fucking wrote it right, right? There's six signatures all written different. It was Shakespeare. But anyway, the point is, life is about taking turns. That's what yeah. I get at. So you're supposed to wonder about what to be. And then there is to be. Now, I know German language, you got two ways to be, right? And they say that's a fundamental thing when talking philosophy. Just because of the language. So I guess it's how you phrase the question. And being a bass player or being part of a band, you said it was my record, but I'm, I'm actually part of a collaboration there. Uh, it's about taking turns. We were talking okay. about to be or not, or not to be. be. So okay, which do you prefer? Well, Let's put it in some kind of fucking context, like we're talking about this record. So when you're making a record with people where yeah. you're improvising, that that is a very good question. When do you play and when do you not play? Who goes first? Who goes second? Who goes third? So Who goes I think, last? I think that it's it's kind of what life's about. It's about taking turn. It's a metaphor. It's an analogy for life itself it's about taking terms we play different roles so especially improvise you know the premise of this project right i do but we okay. will have to explain to our audience okay, first of all we're talking about a project that is called spirit of hamlet and Absolutely. it's involved four people and uh, mike can you tell us a little bit about how the four of you got together it was never meant to be four but I'll tell you how it got together. Oh, yeah, true. It was free, right? How, yeah. it got to, how it got together and how it ended up for. Okay. I've got this show, like you. Except I don't call it what you do. But <laughs> 21 years, eight months now. And during the situation, 14 months, I was having five guests on a week. 
I said almost 300 guests in a little over a year. Uh, actually, this idea of collaborate with people over the internet, I've been doing for almost 15 years. But it got even more intense with the situation. COVID-19, that's it. But anyway, I had this cat, this drummer man, named Scotty Irvin as a guest. We play his Klein Quartet music, and I listened to a, his story about his journey through music, and it's very inspiring. So I ask him, when we get done with the show, hey, I'm also intrigued with the idea of drummers as being composers. So I said, hey, you send me over, you know, a few songs that you write on the drums, and let me try putting bass to it. So he comes up with eight pieces, each distinct with its own kind of drum stuff, parts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. He flows them over to me. I pretend he's in the room because a lot of these guests I had, a lot of the way I get guests is they talk to each other, right? People talking to people. Mm -hmm. And by this period, a lot of dudes that were into fucking free, free music, huh? Uh, improvised mm -hmm. stuff. So that's what I did. In, a, in, a, in an abstract sense. Uh, I pretended when I got Scotty's drums, I pretended he was right in the room there. I got a little studio in my pad. I could record everything but drums called Studio Thunder Pants, Pro Tools HD Omni setup. And I just pretended he was there and I was playing drums to him live at a gig. Okay? And so whatever I heard coming through the headphones, I reacted to, and that became the bass that I gave him. And then he gives the bass that I gave him, along with those drums that started everything, and he gives it to his buddy in Japan, Makoto Kawabata, who I knew of because of Acid Temple, Temple Mother. Uh, but I n didn't know personally. And I loved what he wrote when uh, Scotty gave him the thing because he included me on the CC part of the email. He says, I'm an old man on the mountain, lives on a mountain. I'm an old man who lives on a mountain. And I thought, man, this is the guy we need. <laughs> so he brings his guitar. Now, there's three parts. I think it's finished. It seems that Scotty didn't do all the record himself. I think he used to, but anyway, he has a buddy. He lives in a... North Carolina, right? I think near Greensboro. And he's got a buddy named Benji. He's got a studio called Earth Stones. And so I think they work together, record and stuff. Well, when he brings it to Benji, Benji gets so lit by this shit that he wants to play guitar and sing. He even gets his son to play guitar on one of these things. Now, Benji's the only guy I actually get to meet because a couple of months ago, he, he took his boy on a trip of the west of the U U.S. here and and then Pedro, I gave him a, a tour of my town. A few hours, I drove him around, showed him a bunch of shit. But that's how it ends up a four-man project. So in some ways, total coincidence. But in other ways, a lot of intention. And big time, uh, I think they're very valid human connects using artistic expression. In this case, music. What I also like about the way that the record sounds, the way you described it now, it looks as if, you know, there are a bunch of guys putting layers upon layers upon layers. And we both know that sometimes that, that kind of creating music sounds a little chopped off, a little inhuman. But when I listen to Spirit of Hamlet and the record, I'm like, it actually sounds like as if there are four guys in a room, which is amazing to me because it's a long distance intercontinental project. Do you think that this record became what it is because all of you have a very similar understanding of music and how it should work? Mm, I can't pretend to know why. I would like to guess at People have already been involved with a lot of situations where they are playing live with somebody and they try to like kind of put themselves in that mode, mm -hmm. even though right, that wasn't the reality. But remember, remember Wizard, did you ever see Wizard of Oz? Of course. In 1939, yeah. 
Judy Garland. But yeah, Frank, I didn't see it in 39. But... <laughs> that's when it was made. I didn't either. I was more I know. Seven, okay. But Sputnik, I was, I was born with Sputnik, so it pre, pre, predates me a little bit. But the point is, there's a scene in there near the end where Frank Morgan, the wizard, right, the guy playing the wizard, he says, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Well, he was the fucking man behind the curtain. And it's <laughs> shit here, Thorsten. You don't know how it got made, but you did get a fucking sensation. Here it went, came out of the speakers. So I could either destroy or I could have helped reinforce good things, but whatever. Now I've kind of, by describing what actually happened, what went on behind the curtain, I gave you a perception now that will always change the way you, but that first thing you thought it was a band, right? That was playing together in the same room. So if you ask me, that's a total fucking success. <laughs> it definitely is because I mean, like, um, the way it, it's like a linear construction, right? So basically there is a linear way that this record was constructed, but it doesn't sound linear. It sounds very circular to me, which is a very cool thing. Um, and what I also like about, you've already mentioned um, the, the role of a producer of Benji. Um, so to pinpoint this and to make it clear, the, the music itself, it was first of all never intended to have vocals, right? I, I thought it was just going to be drums, bass, and uh, guitar. And now that you've known the result with vocals, I'm very sure you feel that it adds a lot to it. Well, no, as soon but... as I heard Benji's co contributions, I was totally into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you the, also the imagine... Was... You go first. Could you also imagine publishing the instrumental itself? Well, four of them are instrumental. True. But and, and I mean, I like the, the instrumentals for the tracks where we have vocals. No. Because okay. you no, because this is you'd have to get rid of all of Benji. That's true. Okay. And then, and that's not the way it is. That's not that the way it is. That's like artificially going in. If you mm -hmm. want some kind of variation, okay. But if you want the truth of the collab, you mm -hmm. got to have all the fucking pertinent parts. That I think and that's a very good point. I'm not trying to speak for other people. I'm just saying from from my, my no opinion. no man. I think you have a very valid point there when you say like what you have here. That is the truth. So basically, by now, I guess that you cannot see this project being a 100% clearly and only instrumental thing, right? So now this is a project with instrumental tracks and with vocal tracks. I never, I got to tell you, Thorsten, I never put any fucking expectations on it. I said, whatever it's going to be is going to be. All I can do is my part, help get the ball rolling, and let's see what's going to happen. I wanted to live in the world of opportunity, the O word, not the B word burden. Now, there was, there is a, a slight parallel to what you're talking about. When it came to sequence in this thing, how, what order are we going to put the eight tunes? There was a debate. Scotty suggested maybe four tunes on one side, four tunes on the other, and, and you separate them by the ones who have words and the ones that don't. And I, my, my my position that I advanced or put forward to the other three guys was, let's alternate. Word, no mm -hmm. word, word, no word. Yeah. Because to me, I wanted to make it more like you're driving in the car, you're on the Autobahn, right? You see different shit going by the window. You're on a journey. So there's hills, there's mm -hmm. valleys, there's beaches, yeah. bayou, there's exactly. mountains, there's swamp. Yeah. So that's what I wanted. And I thought to put all uh, no words one side, uh, words on the other side, it, 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 artificial, uh, not organic enough. That's exactly what I meant. So basically, 
you know, without having any expectations, but when you look at the project now, after it's finished, after it's pressed and all of that, now you also, just like you said, it's a very organic way of doing music and not limiting yourself in anything, right? Right. I mean, we had to limit ourselves with the fact that we couldn't be with each other in the same room. So it started with some limitations. But after that, let the fucking freak flag fly. Would I sometimes wonder, being not a musician, but somebody on the outside, um, I'm, I'm very sure that over the course of the last four plus centuries, not centuries, sorry, decades, uh, there will, of course, often have been people who came up to you and said like, ah, that's not punk enough. Oh, yeah. I, I would, I would people figure... That shit for, get this, Thorsten. I've had motherfuckers say that shit to me for wearing a mask and, yeah. and trying not to infect people or yeah. get infected myself. People say that shit, and these are fuckers who hadn't been around. They never had fucking a cup of piss thrown at them or used condoms or sacks of shit. You know, and they're 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 going to fucking define to me what punk is. That's These exactly mother- where I wanted to go at, because yeah, my heart I because hopefully they fucking learn because they're assholes. And it comes from being these fucking internet trolls. It, br- it comes on with this attitude, this false puffed out bullshit kind of thing. But anyway. You know, punk when I was a kid, it was such a bad word here in San Pedro. Punk was a guy who got f- fucked in jail for cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> to call your music that was such a trip to us when we found out about that. But we wanted to be part of that new movement. I mean, like, remember, like, the first time that the word was used um, in a cultural context was Dirty Harry back in the 70s. You know, go ahead, punk, make my day. Of course it was a bad word, but somehow it was turned into a music style. And what I wanted to know is, I mean, like, of course I know that you don't give a shit, which is perfect. Perfect, no, perfect, I perfect. I thought about this a lot. I don't think it is a style of music. You're right. But when I look at the movement, I think it was anti-arena rock. It was about getting back to experiencing music in clubs again. You know, I was helped the Stooges for 125 months and I was finally the youngest guy in the band, but they also told me about the sixties. There was garage bands, little labels, you know, a lot of the stuff that us punk rockers re- actually reinvented in the seventies, mm. just this fucking Nuremberg rally shit happened, you know, with these big gigs. How many bands started at an arena rock gig? And I bet a lot more bands started at a club gig. <laughs> Of course. People talk to each other. I actually, you know, I would have known that a bass had bigger strings. I didn't even know because, you know, me and D. Boone's first gig was T-Rex. The guy was like a sixteenth of an inch tall. I couldn't tell the bass had bigger strings. So when D. Boone's mom put me on bass, I actually played a guitar with only four strings because I didn't know they were bigger. Would you agree with what Paige Hamilton once said where he was asked, so what is punk to him? And he said, like, Oh, you don't have to look like shit to be punk. Yeah, I like him. I have a lot of respect for Brother Page. He's big John Coltrane fan. You know that's what the you know that's what the name of the prod, Spirit of Hamlet. John Coltrane was born in Hamlet, North Carolina. Didn't know that. Yeah, and Scotty and Benji lived near there. His daddy dies, you know, when he's like nine months, so they moved to High Point nearby, and then at high school he moves to Philly, and that's where we know about his music and all that. But he's actually, a lot of cats came out of North Carolina, Dizzy Gillespie, a Thelonious Monk, a, a, a lot of jazz cats. But, uh, and then Philadelphia after that, it's not all New York City, you know, especially the roots. Nah, of it's not always uh, the gap. But, but there's something about music bringing people together, or just the arts in general. You said you're not a musician, but uh, you, you uh, are you a writer? Do you like reading? Uh, you, you you like to use the internet to uh, share information and stuff. To me, that's artistic expression. When I look at your discography, and I think there is a little string that goes through everything you've done, and that is that you are trying to reach for something new or something that you haven't heard before and also something that 
in a way makes people question their own musical listening habits. Let's put it like that. And in that way, I think um, that is something that Spirit of Hamlet um, embodies very well, because um, I think in some way, this free, open, improvisational thing that you put out, these eight songs, at the core, they are trying to challenge probably you as a musician and also us as the listener. Um, however, the way you well, said it, it was never... The, that's what the movement taught me. So I'm kind of paying back on the movement. That when is I went what I wanted the, to know. When I saw the germs, when I saw, you know, the Dills, Nervous Gender, the Screamers, you know, those bands up in Hollywood, it just changed my whole world. And I've been in debt to those cats ever since. I got those pop group records, Wire records, uh, where you live, Der Plan and uh, Ameri Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft. Mm -hmm. Those records fucking blew my mind. I wanted to be part of that. I didn't want to know the same old, same old, you know? I wanted to be mm -hmm. shook up and see what happens. Do you feel like nowadays it becomes more difficult for you to find something that you haven't done before? Uh, no, because of the internet. I get exposed to a lot of people I've never met. I think in the older days, it was tougher. It had to be people who came into your life, you know, in person. Mm -hmm. Maybe some stuff through a letter, maybe some stuff with a phone call. But man, the internet, you could actually go out and collab with cats. I've made whole albums with people and I've been doing this for years now. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never even met them. And uh, so I have a lot of uh, optimism and hope and meet and challenge in situations. Because I, I, this is another thing that came with me with middle age. The idea that sincerely you believe everyone's got something to teach you just as long as you keep your mind open enough to listen to them and maybe even join in on a collab with them. Yeah. So when I heard or when I listened to some of your tracks, I'm like, for everybody who hasn't listened to them, take your time, sit down and listen to the record at least three times, minimum, I would say, because the first time will be overwhelming, the second will be a little bit more understanding, and the third time you'll probably get what they're trying to say. Um, however, what I like about the record is that it sometimes give you, gives you those little different tonalities. For example, when I listen to March of Rain, I hear a song that is very bright. There are parts in March of Rain where I say, okay, that sounds like California sunshine to me. And I'm very sure for other people, it will be something totally different. But when you listen to March of Rain or Float or some of the other tracks, what does the record make you feel like? What I feel like when I hear that, what we succeeded in doing was making a genuine conversation. I can hear all four cats speaking to each other. And to me, that's what you're always trying to do when you get more than one person playing together, an ensemble. Mm -hmm. That's what I really hear that with this spirit of Hamlet. I hear the cats involved with no hierarchy. Nobody's got an, a boot on anybody else's throat. No kind of bullshit like that. It's, it's Aiden in a bed. It's taking turns. It's a, mm -hmm. it's fucking an interesting conversation. Could you imagine doing that on a stage? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, I want to get chapter two going. And I want it to done the same way with Scotty started. Let the drum, drummer start it. Mm -hmm. Which is also a very interesting thing because very often, I mean, like we both know that very often the drummers are not that highly regarded for their songwriting abilities. Jackie Leibzig, oh my God, what an inspiration that cat. 
and Chico Hamilton couldn't get songwriting credits, right? Maybe the mm-hmm. notes last short, but it's still a fucking instrument. And, it, and especially this kind of stuff, it's rhythm music. You're in total denial of you trying to say it's some kind of like sub musician uh, position. It's, yeah. a, it's, I really hate it. Biggest mistake Minutemen made was putting George Hurley in the rear. Last 20 years, I've had all my drummers when I do gigs play up front, downstage. Yeah. You mean like really up front so that they're yeah. close to right on the, lip of the stage, on the lip of the stage, mm-hmm. kind of at an angle. And so all of us yeah. play together. And it's, I, I really believe in the ensemble. And I think part of that first is my machine. The bass is kind of, yeah, four string guitar, right? If you're looking at a picture of it. But if you're playing it or working it, four string drum set, we share a lot. And here's the proof of that. Fender makes something called a Fender 6 that's tuned down like a bass guitar, but it has skinny strings. It don't sound like a bass guitar. There's, you don't have that punch. There's something about the bass guitar that's trippy. It's kind of this weird glue thing. So uh, yeah. I, I lucked out. You know, I, I lucked out. It's still mysterious. It's still defining itself. But so is drummer as composer. You know? That stuff, it's coming on. I, again, I think part of this is residue from Marina Rock, the fucking mid-range. They were built for sports, a lot of these venues. They were never built for good acoustics. So yeah. you couldn't hear the bass player. You couldn't hear the drum. Yeah. So anyway, you- things change. People open their minds. God, how young people's e- minds are so much open, more open than when I was young. We wouldn't listen to shit that was even five years old. The young man today will listen to 40, 50 year old Black Sabbath, no problem. That is true. Do you think that in some ways, you know, in general, rock diminishes and denies the importance of the rhythm section? Yeah, well, maybe. Earl Palmer invents the kick drum, right? Little Richards drummer because it couldn't carry a bass player. So a lot of this shit is very pragmatic, how it developed. But rock and roll was kind of marketed on this teenager thing. It wasn't even about music. It was about kids still living at home and it had extra money <laughs> in the 50s. No bombs on the US, so yeah, okay. Happy days. Well, fuck Potsy, fuck Fonzie, that shit never happened. My pop said that there never was happy days. That is bullshit, which is a lot of <laughs> sentimentals and nostalgia. Here's the other problem I got with that, Thorsten. I think music is music, and I don't like the idea of genres. Genre to me is like gulags and Berlin walls. <laughs> hey, they're very something to that, yes. It's just personal point I have. No, they're very so, something to that. Uh, rhythm section, look, the problem with rhythm section in the old days, no amplifiers. So piano, drummer, bass, guitar, we were all in the rhythm section trying to keep up them fucking horns. Then when we got amplifiers, the first guy's Charlie Christian on guitar. Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker both say he invented bebop because now he can d- do single note lines. So, you know, these kind of innovations, whose rhythm section, who's, you know, the melody, who's established in the temas. Again, it's like to be or not to be. It's about taking turns. Do I listen now or do I play? Do I make a statement? You know, uh, anybody who's in this on a kind of ethical egalitarian thing is going to know you pass it around to everybody. So nobody should be on this kind of hierarchy thing. It should serve the tune. Everyone should serve the tune and not the section of the means of producing the tune, in my opinion. Uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. What I also like about coming back to the bass guitar, what I like about it, um, especially the the amplified bass, of course, um, that you have a chance to basically play it like a guitar. What yeah. a lot of people that I love do very, very well, for example, like Reto Meda from some of our and Jigong and lots of our projects, he, he plays basically a guitar tuned down. Very, very well done. And at the same time, it is um, a rhythm instrument. Did you ever think about using another instrument as your main go-to instrument? 
man, I haven't even got to the five string bass. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much to fucking learn with the four string bass. Uh, D Boone taught me a little stuff on mandolin. I can play acoustic guitar a little bit. The strings are too fucking skinny. Maybe I write 5%. I did write my third opera all on one of his Telecasters, but I'm not very, I can't hold a pick, you know. I think if I went to other instruments, I would dilute my mission on bass, which is mm -hmm. to learn more about it. When you say that your mission is to learn more about the bass, where would you say are you right now? Are you a novice or are you already a master or are you somewhere in between? Journeyman. So if we were talking Freemasonry, the second degree. Okay. Not apprentice, I'm not master, I'm journeyman. And actually, I'm the product of these cats I meet, the situations they put me on, because each time it's a fucking classroom. It's, it's it's the electric shop at high school, right? Vocational training. Yeah. Yeah, even if the cat's just learning how to play, even if it's a dude who's been around forever. Yeah, I'm trying to keep myself open so I can learn from the situation. Get down the road, trying to learn this fucking bass. You know, it's I weird about the physics. The, because of the physics, the more notes we play, the smaller we get. So it ain't about like playing the most notes. It's about finding the notes that fit the best, the rhythms that fucking aid and abet. This, I was on this radio show that does the Dodgers, right, sports. So these guys, yeah, not very deep with music, but they said, what, what are you trying to do with the bass? I said, you know, the closest note to me on the stage is a kick drum. I'm learning how to dance with that kick drum. It's very interesting because in some way it all comes back again to that Shakespeare thing, right? You know, it is not a yes. question of whether you're standing in the starlight, but whether you are contributing, which is a very interesting yeah. thing. It's also from uh -huh. my experience. You got to understand, Thorsten, I got into music, not as a musician. I got into music just to be with Dee Boone, my friend. We were 12. And then I lost him. So I really had to find something that made sense to me to stay in the music. So to make it this kind of search and to fucking be committed to be curious about what are the possibilities. That's that's what I'm trying to do with that uh, yeah. thunder, thunder broom, thud stick, whatever you want, boom stick, whatever you want to call it. And you have highly succeeded over the course of your career. Um, and of course, I cannot let you go without a few questions about the times before Spirit of Hamlet. So I came up with a few of them that I think might be interesting for our listeners. Um, you have been in a lot of bands. I, I unfortunately think that a lot of you will only associate you with Minutemen and Firehose. If you only think about that, then you should have a look at the guy's discography. There is much more. However, what I liked is you have Mike, Matt, Mike Watt and the Second Man, the Missing Man, the um, Minutemen and the Second Missing Man. Which man group will be next, Mike? There's also the Bobbly Men. Yes, <laughs> I just took a few examples. Well, Bobbly Men, I'm going to record Sunday, coming up in six days, five days. Uh, Christmas 2023, 45, we're going to record. Uh, okay. Yeah, all those Second Man, Missing Men, they're plays on the, the Minutemen name. Of course. You got to understand the name of that band. D. Boone, he said, look, get a piece of paper, and write me a bunch of band names, and I'll pick one. So I had all, this big list of like 50 names, and a lot of them were terrible. I had this one, it actually was two names. It was my new, and I was making fun of our whole experience with arena rock when we were teenagers. So I said, minute men. And Dee <laughs> Boone said, no, man, let's make that one word. Because minute men was a name, it was a slang name for some people early in the U.S. revolution. And some right wing group from the 30s, fascist kind of thing, you know. He said they had they were trying to appropriate patriotic symbols she so said why don't we call ourselves the same things and that will dilute any kind of power that they're going to try to have mm. i said okay 
So that's how we got that name, okay? I actually was thinking minute man. Okay, Spe- you know, English is weird. You can't go by the spelling. You got to hear somebody say it first. <laughs> that's fucked up. Yeah, but I English get- is still easier than Gaelic. I, I got to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did that on purpose, though, because the English got forced on them. Anyway, uh, going back to the, those other men, when I have Mike Watt in the name of my proj, that's because I'm giving the direction. I'm writing all the music, all the words. I want you to know who to blame. <laughs> okay. Mike Watt and the missing man. Well, Mike, the second man I put together for my second opera. The first opera was Mike Watt and the Black Gang doing Contemplating the Injury. Room. The story of my father in the Navy used that to talk about the Minutemen, losing D. Boone. Second man was the band I put together. Pedro guys, Longshoreman, Pete Mazes, Jerry Trebitich, Croatian guy, uh, ethnic, uh, to do my second opera, the Mills, uh, Second Man's Middle Stand, where the sickness almost killed me at, at 43 years old. And I paralleled Dante's Comedia. The Missing Man I put together to do my third opera about being a middle-aged punk rocker called Hyphenated Man. So all those bands actually had purposes. They were... They weren't put together just to jam. They were put together to realize these operas I had, which were like big hour-long songs in a bunch of parts. That's why I call them operas. Kind of mm-hmm. uh, influenced by uh, a quick one while he's away, The Who. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's where those things come from. They are all kind of related, you know, but they're very focused things. I am going to make another Second Man and Missing Men album that aren't That's operas, awesome. just a collection of tunes. And they're kind of dedicated to those guys I played with because they realized the mission. We did it. We came together. They helped. They took my direction. We realized the operas. We recorded them. We did tours. It was beautiful. I owe those guys tons. You also were in lots of other bands. And I'm going to list, or you work with lots of other bands. I'm, I'm just going to list a few. You already mentioned Iggy and the Stooges. We had Chicone Youth, Flipper, Porno for Pyrus, J Masses, and of course, Firehose. And I could probably go on for like 30 more minutes because you seem to have a discography of like 300 bands. Out of all of those, well, I don't want to hear it. Believe, uh, I, I, believe it or not, the European band, El Sonio de Manaio, two Italian guys. I don't want to pick any any like negative vibes out here, but who was for you the easiest to work with? Apart from the Minutemen. We all were. And actually, I'm helping a guy right now, Mike Baguetta with MSSV. It's the first time somebody's written bass parts for me. Usually when I help somebody out, I have to learn the parts of the dead guy. But he actually wrote me bass parts. I've never had that happen. Uh, You know, if it gets too difficult, I just say this ain't working. You You know, fishermen, they say cut bait, cut rope. Yeah, because if it ain't happening, then it ain't happening. And anything forced is going to sound forced. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, maybe you're not the right cat for the situation. Not the right cat for so, the game. Yeah, yeah. So everybody, all these things you mentioned, they maybe had some parts that were difficult. But for the most part, these cats were all fucking bitching to play with. And something where you, a question that you probably have been asked already a lot of times, but um, your strangest experience on tour? Uh, I've had a lot. I'll I tell you one time we were doing low, uh, with the Stooges you, you, you mentioned, we we're doing a Lowland Festival in Holland and uh, we we're doing Little Doll. And they knocked me over. I kept playing. I didn't lose one note. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was on the deck. <laughs> yeah, when the boss knocks you over, that's a trip. <laughs> so after, Iggy after knocked after you gig- over? Yeah. 
I mean, like he's I like he, he's like I nearly kept... two heads shorter than you. Yeah, but I was focused on playing the bass and shit, and you know, I didn't <laughs> see him. Usually, I'm up, my eyes are always on him, but they left him for a second, and I paid for that. Boom! Here comes the <laughs> it was like f- flying body block. I mean, whoa! And that man is a strong man. Yeah, he is a little yeah, but... shorter, but he's a strong man. Yeah. How do you like the yeah. jazz record after that he did? Show, look, after, after the show, he said, "Man, Mike, I hope that you didn't mind that. You know, just work in the show, work in the room." Yeah, and I understood. It was nothing personal. It was no belage. Of course not. How do you like his jazz record? I love all his stuff. He's just a big inspiration to me. I just love him. I loved all those guys. Uh, Ronnie, you know, he was way into history, Scotty into nature, Brother Steve into politics, and all those guys. And, you know, they're gone now. Only eggs left. James Williamson, he was very nice to me. It's also interesting that the one guy who most would have thought to die first is the one that remains standing, right? Yeah, but Show, he, he, he shows started, his strength. Well, he started taking care of himself, too. He got clean. Yeah. But he had some rough times. Oh, man. He told me some stories. Oh, God. And the Ashton brothers told me some stories about him. One time, Ronnie told me he fucking it cracked his head open on the corner of a Coke machine, you know, a vending machine. And he had to use gaffer tape to fucking, like, a big crack in his skull. He taped up his head. <laughs> But it, it sounds like something that definitely has happened in Iggy's lifetime. So, um... <laughs> First of all, Mike, thanks for this. And of course, I cannot leave you with our infamous quickfire round at the end of every interview here on Veil of Sound. So I'll give you alternatives and you have to choose one of them and uh, maybe give a short explanation for why. So like roses versus tulips. Why do you like the one better than the other? And we'll start with something easy related to the Stooges. Curly, Curly, Larry or Moe? Larry. Hendrix. Oh, do you want to know or just an answer? <laughs> Larry. All good, all good. You... Ronnie took care of Larry at the Hollywood home in his last years. Mm-hmm. When uh, Ronnie was living in Hollywood when the Stooges were there, Ronnie took care of him, would get him stuff from the store and stuff. Yeah, there's a connection. And uh, they had to call the, when they got signed to ask permission to use the names, and those guys said yes. Okay. Hendrix or Zeppa? Oh, definitely, Jimmy. I think By we way, all... I, I, I think Float is one of the nicest jazz homages to Jimi Hendrix ever. It's a really, really cool song. It's my I, favorite what, on the record. You know what Jimmy said about Mitch Mitchell? Nope. He's my Elvin Jones. Mm, yeah, that's a good comparison. Minor fret or Jimmy's fugazi? Words. Jimmy's words. Uh, Minor fret or fugazi? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, Joe Lolly, huh? Fugazi. Mm-hmm. And Brendan. Oh, what a fucking drummer, Brendan. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he gets the common mm-hmm. thing, right? And Guy's bitching too. I got to play with Rite of Spring. In fact, I borrowed his bass. It had a cracked neck, kept pitching the palm of my hand. Black Flag or Million Dead Cops? Oh, Black Flag, of course. Million Dead Cops, actually, their first name was the Stains. But when they heard there was an East LA Stains, they changed their name. I love it when, t- when I'm talking to guys like you who. who outshine me in every way I, I think when sometimes like, I'm like oh I know my shit and then people like you come around and I'm like no. give me an try insight because some of this stuff like in that situation I was there <laughs> probably crowd rock or psych rock I heard those German bands didn't like that name crowd rock some English guy gave them the name yeah but they didn't <laughs> They didn't. They didn't see themselves as crowd rock at I remember, all. But still, you know, I'm going to use I, the term crowd rock or psych rock. You know, I was a boy in the '60s, so World War II sh- TV shows, right? Combat, and that's all that. 
Vic Morrow would say was Krauts, Krauts, Krauts. So I'm always <laughs> seeing the black and white TV shit with Krauts, you know. But when I hear that music, I'm hearing uh, young German guys trying to make rock music their own way. And it's really interesting. It's really interesting that I mean, I'm glad the English guys copy blues because they had to teach us our own music again. But I'm so glad uh, the German guys didn't do that. You know, it already has been done. Right. So they went and tried their own way. And it's it's very interesting, which psych rock is that 13th floor elevators? Yeah. OK. I think for me, the question is psych rock versus Grateful Dead, because if I'm going to listen to psychedelic music, I want it really crazy and wild, like first Pink Floyd album or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, what's that, Radioactivity. Yeah, you I'm mean the, like, uh, um, you, you mean stuff just with mixed, Sid Barrett. It's mixed really crazy, so you'll trip balls. Because, you know, that's the way we used to listen to our punk records when we'd, we'd wait till the weekend when we had time off. We wouldn't listen to them. We didn't know what they were about, right? You'd buy these things just because of the record covers. The press didn't write about that shit over here. So you just buy it by the band name or the thing. So we'd eat LSD and then listen to this stuff and it'd blow our fucking minds. So something like Grateful Dead that was all calm, we didn't like. We wanted, if you were going to trip, we wanted to trip hard. Mm -hmm. So, so which one would you choose, crowd rock or psych? Well, for for one thing, I you know, I love Noi, I love Can, I love, you know, Faust. And then Faust, each record's different. It's, I can't lump them into one thing. Like, to me, I said music is music. Yeah. So, yeah, so. I'm, I'm, and I'm being pretty fucked up with you not answering that question directly. Oh, well, that's, that's all good. The explanation <laughs> that you're given is much more than I could hope for. Um, <laughs> Well, does does toot mir lied? Okay. Uh, touring <laughs> versus careful writing and recording. Yeah, I can't do it. I can't compose when I'm touring. It's such an endeavor unto itself, you know. I mm. do write though. What I write on tour ain't songs. It's tour diary. Go to mikewatt.com. Last 20 years. I should have been doing it the 20 years before that, but slow learner. Sorry. Punk versus noise. Mm. Punk can be noise. Noise can be punk. Yeah, and noise and noise can be punk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so, so you're weaseling around again, very nicely. I think um, it's a. I think it's a, a superficial uh, demarcation. Yeah, it's true. Not, Do you know not, what no, Mertzbo said about just, noise? Thorsten, Thorsten, no d disrespect to you when I say that. I know. Do you know okay. what Mertzbo said about noise? <laughs> I, <laughs> I'd be interested. I, I love that quote by, by Mertzbo because he said, um, if noise music is, uh, is meant to make you uneasy, then pop music to me is noise. Do you know Boris? Of course. Okay, Atsuo told me he did a collaboration with Mer. Okay, you know what he told me? He says, Mare's bow. Tell me. When he listens to music casually, he listens to Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. <laughs> That's what Atsuo told me. Doesn't surprise <laughs> me. It doesn't surprise me. And I got two more for you. Flannel shirts or silk pajamas? Flannel. Flannel. Although silk is bitching. The way it feels, the way it looks. And the last one. Yeah. And the last one. Hamlet or Macbeth? Uh, Hamlet. Hamlet. Hamlet, he, you know, he's on a mission. He's searching. Where Macbeth, you know, superstition, corruption. Yeah. I mean, there's corruption with the Hamlet too, but the the cat Hamlet himself, he's kind of on a mission. He wants to. Yeah, and I think it's still the greatest theater piece ever written. You know, I probably am biased being an English I think teacher, there was but... politics. I think there was politics around Macbeth. 
because James had just gotten on the throne and he was all freaked out about witch. This is when they started burning witches big time. And so I think uh, yeah, whoever and wrote this was making fun of that shit. Definitely. And it's also trying to stir up something. Um, but at the same time, when you look at Shakespeare, I mean, like, it, it becomes very clear when you look at the history of the real Macbeth, because that guy actually was a pretty well-liked person in Scottish history. Oh, and I... then there comes this guy and turns him into a villain. So, Look, so. Stanley Kubrick with Steve King's Shining. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that happens. I mean, you already got that one work of art. If the other dude's going to build on top of it, let him bring something, not just make some fucking Xerox machine job on it. <laughs> That's my opinion. So, and, and it's totally valid, I think. So, Mike, thanks for, this for being too. on the show. Thorsten, you got to remember this too. King James was Mary Queen of Scots' son. Yeah. One Lisbeth and he had was killed. Isn't that funny? And he was uh, the one that in introduced the Bible again into England. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this burden of witches and stuff. And he was a, a strange guy. He was actually James the first of, Eng of United Kingdom, but James VI of Scotland. Yeah. And back then, it's not even the United Kingdom. It's uh, two different realms that he was reigning. Mike. Thanks for being on the show. I could have chatted a lot longer, but I got to go. Family is waiting. For everybody else, um, please don't think that Mike Watt is only some of the bands that we mentioned. Look at all the stuff he did and especially listen to Spirit of Hamlet, a great free jazz, post punk, whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's simply great music. Most kind, Thorsey. Dalka. So, Mike, your chance for final last words. Uh, we keep on keeping on. That's it. So, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. Give me the opportunity to spiel with you. Whenever you want to, we can do that again. So, talk soon. Uh, my beautiful.